everyone. I think that there's only one other person on, so uh, I guess it's going to be a little small group today. Um, I'm Rosalia Masseri. I am a pediatric urologist at Riley in Indianapolis, and I take care of a large population of uh, kids with spina bifida. And interestingly, over the last 15 years or so, I've learned a whole lot about taking care of these kids. Um, I also take care of uh, the adults with spina bifida in our group. So I was going to share kind of some of my thoughts on the, um, on the group. Okay, so now a few disclosures. I am in the eyes of the American Board of Urology, a pediatric urologist who cares for adults with congenital urologic diseases. Much of the approach I have to adults is deeply rooted in my experiences with them as children and emerging adults. Today I'm focusing my discussion on what we've learned about kids with spina bifida who have grown up. And boy, things do change while they're growing up. I won't focus on the transition process or how to do it best. And remember that this is probably done at a local level to figure out what's best with, with your administrators. Now, that girl in that picture is not the typical patient with spina bifida. And there are many factors that have allowed her to flourish and be independent. The neuropsychological consequences of spina bifida are heterogeneous and complex and are related to malformations of the brain like here malformations and hydrocephalus. Neurologic insults and cognitive defects, these can all affect independence. And independence varies based on the level of the lesion, how many shunt procedures a patient has had, the history of seizures, their age, socioeconomics, ethnicity and family stresses. As patients get older, their interests change. So Murray and colleagues found that emerging adults with spina bifida lag behind peers when it came to alcohol use and sexual activity, but they do participate in some risky behaviors at similar rates compared to their peers. For example, they will smoke. Their risk behaviors may be influenced by the level of their social adjustment. And they do seek similar experiences as we all do. They do want to work, but they are less likely to be employed than individuals without spina bifida. Studies in the US and Sweden have shown employment rates at about 31 to 38 percent. Healthy relationships and expectance and acceptance similarly are important to these patients. It's not uncommon for me to see adult patients with their elderly parents, and these elderly parents remain their primary caregivers. The psychosocial function of the family is altered from the time of this disabled child's birth. Usually it's the mother who takes most of the responsibility for the child's care. Oftentimes there are families that are broken by this uh, child with a disability. The social, psychological, and economic domains of the family are radically changed the minute this patient is born. Many parents struggle to care for their adult children as they themselves become weaker and less able to care for them. They're faced with additional challenges and are often very concerned about the future of their disabled child. Caretakers therefore change as the parents get older. This responsibility may fall on the siblings. Sometimes they move into group homes or nursing facilities and this seems to be affected by where the patient is living. Parents are often the only one with the knowledge for completing tasks like urinary catheterization, transfers, and bowel regimens. The person who takes over the care of the dependent adult with spina bifida needs technical and emotional preparedness. Financial care is also a significant consideration for these parents, patients. <laughs> 
Some studies have suggested that up to two-thirds of adults with spina bifida do not seek regular urologic follow-up, which can further lead to higher mortality and more urgent care visits among patients. As we know, there are several barriers to transition. I believe that these vary from community to community and hospital to hospital. Among these barriers are barriers that include changes in insurance, the distance to a tertiary care. Some studies have suggested that up to two thirds. The complexity and severity of health issues experienced by people with spina bifida leads to high utilization of healthcare resources. An American study similar to a Canadian study found that hospital admission rates were more than 12 times higher for adults with spina bifida than for the general population. It's uncertain if these complications can be prevented, but it is clear that they may not be receiving many of the preventative services that are necessary. Again, this may be related to difficulties in accessing care, insurance barriers, and multiple health conditions. Neuropsychological testing and documentation of decision-making abilities and guardianship status upon entering the adult system may also improve health outcomes. As we assume that the patient understands the issue at hand, which oftentimes is not true. As patients get older, their bodies change. The average incidence of obesity within the adult spina bifida population ranges from 30 to 50% and appears to be higher with increased intellectual disabilities. Specifically, there's a fourfold higher incidence of obesity from childhood to adulthood and a twofold increase in obesity from adolescence to adulthood. Additionally, contractures and scoliosis may increase with increasing age. The changes in the patient's body habitus with aging significantly impacts health and our ability to deliver appropriate health care. Things as simple as a physical examination may be in <clears throat> impacted by patient size, by mobility, and by body habitus. So long-term success of our interventions, even those as simple as intermittent catheterization, may be directly related to prevention of obesity, attention to scoliosis, and other bodily changes. The goals of therapy for people with spina bifida in my mind are four, and this kind of mirrors what uh, Doug Hoosman always says, and that is to preserve life, to protect the kidneys, to achieve continence, and to allow patients to live the best possible life. We have succeeded in improving mortality, particularly related to renal failure, but our primary goal remains to preserve renal function. Renal function is typically normal at birth, but may deteriorate over the lifespan. And this is primarily due to functional abnormalities of the neurogenic bladder. Untreated, up to 50% would develop chronic kidney disease. In pediatrics, we argue about expectant management versus pro proactive management. Expectant management essentially means that you follow a patient and intervene when you notice upper tract changes. The definition of proactive management varies significantly, but most frequently involves early and regular urodynamic testing. Ideally, CIC with or without pharmacotherapy is started early based on urodynamic findings. Studies have shown that up to 40% of patients have some impairment in renal function and that end-stage renal disease is the cause of death in 9 to 29% of patients. And Veen Bors noted, uh, reported this in a 2012 meta-analysis. Estimated GFR has been most commonly used to determine renal dysfunction in spina bifida patients. However, because of low muscle mass and underdeveloped musculature, the legs are quite small creatinine-based methods to evaluate renal function 
are poorly sensitive in this group. Once an abnormal seer react and is noted, a loss of more than two thirds of nephrons may have already occurred. In the general population, the American Society of Nephrologists suggests referral to a nephrologist with, if the estimated GFR is 60, or if macroalbuminuria is present. There are no specific recommendations for patients with spina bifida. Cystatin C-based EGFR may assist global renal function in these patients, but it's not widely available and may be expensive. And despite its ability to estimate GFR, it cannot predict the extent of renal damage or scarring. The best knowledge is gained by DMSA scan. Up to 25% of people may have been noted to have scarring on such studies. Iothalamate and uh, DTPA uh, may be useful to determine GFR. Keep talking about the kidneys, and if we look, population-based longitudinal studies of the natural history of spina bifida uh, and associated renal damage is quite scarce. And it's difficult to interpret because of different management and timing of intervention. So we're not sure which one uh, may preserve the kidneys the best. Is it early intervention? Is it expectant management? These risks for injury, however, are well defined. Adherence to catheterization schedules worsen with time as parents may not be performing them and the structure of school no longer exists. So they might not be catheterizing as they could. Some of my patients with jobs will forego catheterization because they feel like it takes too long or they've been recommended by their managers for being in the bathroom for too long. Your dynamic risk factors for the development of chronic kidney disease include DS. When we think about patients with spina bifida, we also often worry about urinary tract infections. And these patients do have several urinary tract infections. So despite improvements in the management of the neurogenic bladder, the incidence of UTI in people with spina bifida remains very high and it continues to be a When we think about side effects, so if a patient has new or recurrent UTIs, they should be evaluated stones, their catheterization technique, and I would watch this carefully because a lot of patients with spina bifida will have very lousy technique, including not using lubricant or storing their cath. side effects. So if a patient has new or recurrent UTIs, they should be evaluated for stones, their catheterization technique, and I would watch this carefully because a lot of patients with spina bifida will have very lousy technique, including not using lubricant or storing their catheters in unusual spots. They should be evaluated for uh, bladder dynamics and for reflux. Their bowel program should be reviewed and anatomic changes should also be looked at. So are there any post-surgical changes? Are there clips that may interfere uh, with things? Do they have hydronephrosis or do they have bladder diverticuli? As patients get older, so does their, con uh, so does their continence change. Um, changes in continence, recurrent UTIs, Virulithiasis are all important indicators of bladder dynamics. So conversely, changes in bladder dynamics may cause recurrent UTI. Worsening continence may be related to poor adherence to catheterization and 
poor adherence to antimuspirinic therapies. The inability to catheterize may be related to false passages, to neonatal stenosis, to strictures of the needed urethra. In patients who catheterize pre-urethra, up to 40% may have difficulties catheterizing over time. Lubricant helps prevent these complications, but I'm always surprised by the number of people who skip the lubricant. I may also, this may also be related to complications of, in the catheterizable channels, and we'll discuss that later. Obesity makes it very difficult in some patients to access either their native urethra or even their channels. Uh, recently, I had to call social work to help find assistance for an obese woman lived independently and complained of incontinence. The reason for her incontinence was that she couldn't reach her urethra. And in addition to the SOL, a suprapubic catheter could be placed because of the severe fungal rash that she had. So incontinence does cause problems. Skin breakdown, like I just talked about, an infection may be a consequence, but it also affects health-related quality of life and self-esteem. There's an increased risk of social isolation and underemployment in patients with incontinence. Fecal incontinence is also problematic as patients get older. Bowel dysfunction in people with spina bifida may be as high as 86%, and up to 40% remain incontinent despite therapy. And a review of patients presenting to an adult spina bifida clinic who reports on the National Spina Bifida Registry, 58% had fecal incontinence. Therapies reported in the adult group include manual disinfection, digital stimulation, colostomy, and base. And therapies usually vary uh, by age, so it's less common for a young child to have a colostomy, but certainly becomes more common as patients become older. Fecal incontinence is affected by colonic transit time, by anorectal dysfunction, and by rectal sensation. In patients with maces, I've noticed that flushing regimens may require adjustments over time, and this is likely a manifestation of colonic function that changes over time. Wiener and colleagues, again, reviewing the National Spina Bifida Patient Registry, correlated fecal incontinence to the likelihood of being employed, attaining higher education, and found lower levels of spina bifida, such as um, sacral agenesis, had uh, less fecal incontinence. Interestingly, publicly insured patients were more likely to have fecal incontinence than those with private insurance. Um, and this not quite sure how to explain it. Here's a graph demonstrating health-related quality of life in people with spina bifida across age ranges. These patients were in, U in the United States surveyed, surveyed using the Qualys online survey. And um, several spina bifida clinics were also included. And overall, we found that 73% had urinary incontinence and 52% had fecal incontinence, whereas 43.6% had both. Adjusting for concurrent urinary and fecal incontinence, any urinary incontinence was associated with a lower quality of life in older children and adults. All ages reported lower health related quality of life with fecal incontinence. And a multivariate analysis, quantity, not frequency of urinary incontinence, and fecal incontinence intervals were associated with lower quality of life. So any fecal incontinence was associated with lower health-related quality of life in all ages. Since this was a cross-sectional study, we were unable to track health-related quality of life over time, 
in a particular individual. But these findings suggest that the concept of social continence based on time interval has no health-related quality of life relevance in children, adolescents, or adults with spina bifida. When we looked at adults, uh, we had 518 participants, 55% had fecal incontinence and 76% had urinary incontinence. About 40% had both fecal and urinary incontinence. And we found that fecal incontinence and urinary incontinence are independent predictors of lower quality of life in adults with spina bifida. When we looked at quality of life, it was lower with an increasing amount of urinary incontinence, but fecal incontinence had a more uniform impact and it negatively impacted health-related quality of life regardless of the frequency or the amount of incontinence. In 2006, we retrospectively reviewed 500 bladder augmentations performed over a 25-year period, and uh, these patients had a mean follow-up of 13 years. The patients included, this included patients with and without spina bifida, including patients with extra fee, and we found that 34% needed additional surgery. So we're gonna talk about some of the complications of surgery. More recently, we retrospectively reviewed patients with spina bifida followed at Riley after augmentation. And these were patients born after 1972, and we used 1972 because that's when CIC was introduced. And we call this the modern era after 2000. In this group, we found the risk of reoperation to be about 43%. And this group uh, was at highest risk for reoperation because of stones. Tumors found in this group were nephrogenic adenomas identified on cystoscopy due to abnormalities noted within the bladder. And uh, since the study was published, we found one additional patient who had a, a gastric uh, carcinoma in an augmented segment. When we look at stones within the bladder, um, we understand that this is the most common complication that we see after augmentation, and they present a very interesting clinical dilemma. Specifically, access to the calculi can be tricky, particularly in those with bladder neck reconstructions, channels, and cont contractures. They can be done endoscopically or open, but perhaps the most interesting approach uh, reported by uh, Kate Kraft and colleagues in Michigan was using a trans-psoas approach. Not tried that yet, but perhaps we will. Bladder stone formation after augment uh, in conjunction with continent abdominal stomas has been reported to be as high as 50% within five years after surgery in many studies. Uh, of significant concern within this patient population is that 50% of the patients that initially developed a stone had a second stone within five years of their first stone. In our study, bladder stones recurred in almost half of patients at nine years postoperatively, independent of the treatment technique and patient characteristics. So whether you blasted them or took them out whole, their risk was the same. Interestingly, we also found that a third of these patients did not have in infectious stones. In um, Hoosman's studies, they failed to decrease stone recurrence rates by correcting the underlying metabolic defect or by adding mucolytic agents compared to high volume irrigations. And they did document that daily high volume bladder irrigations, that is greater than 240 milliliters of water or saline, significantly decreased the incidence of bladder calculi. Uh, 
from 47% to 5% over a five-year period. Confirming our uh, suspicions, our recent study confirmed that bladders augmented with detubularized segments had higher rates of reaugment. Bladders were re-augmented for refractory uninhibited contraction, small capacity, or both. Less commonly, a re-augmentation was performed due to inability to empty the double bubble like you see in this picture. Clinically, patients presented with urinary incontinence, bladder perforation, or upper tract changes. Perforation, of course, is uh, a dreaded complication of bladder augmentation, and this could be due to traumatic catheterization, over distension, chronic infection, ischemia, and increased intravesical pressure. The prevalence of spontaneous bladder perforations reported to be between 6 and 13%, and in our study, spontaneous bladder perforation was 59% lower in the detubularized group than it was in the um, non-detubularized group. Perforation can result in peritonitis, sepsis, and death, and uh, these patients all often present very, very, very ill. Sometimes patients with bladder augmentations go on to require diversion. And the 10-year risk of diversion at Riley is about 2.7%. And although these bladders were augmented with detubularized segments, um, they still required um, these diversions. And the indications include perforation, intractable incontinence, upper tract deterioration, and inability to catheterize. When we look at malignancy, about 4.5% incidence with a minimum of 10 years follow-up. And these, the patients at greatest risk are smokers, immunocompromised patients, patients with gastric augments, patients with neuropathic bladder and bladder extrophy. In a review of 153 patients with augmented bladders with a minimum of a 10-year follow-up, Hoosman and Rathborn found that 4.5%. Based on the work of Austin and colleagues, it also appears that the risk of malignancy may be inherent to the neuropathic bladder even without augmentation. And in their series of patients with spina bifida, they had a higher risk than the general population of developing bladder malignancies. And these patients had atypical presentation and poor survival with only one of eight of their patients surviving the bladder cancer. So I do believe that careful lifelong surveillance of these patients is mandatory. In lieu of routine surveillance, endoscopy, and cytology. I've adopted the criteria for endoscopy proposed by Higuchi and colleagues. And these include four more symptomatic UTIs per year, a history of gross hematuria, and a urinalysis with greater than 50 red cells per high para field, chronic perineal, pelvic or bladder pain, abnormal radiographs, and all patients with colonic segments at 50 years or greater consistent with the recommendations for colonoscopy. Additionally, patients with immunosuppressants have been identified as having an independent risk factor for malignancy. Now, bladder neck uh, procedures. I think that there is a role for bladder neck procedures. I do not love bladder neck procedures, but they're certainly helpful when there's persistent incont incontinence with consequences like skin breakdown, poor hygiene, poor self-esteem, and poor quality of life. So while the bladder neck closure uh, offers excellent continence rate, 
it's important to have a bladder neck closure it, that a, a, when you look at a bladder neck closure or a bladder neck reconstruction that leads to a very small channel that uh, you have a motivated patient who's adherent, who's backed by a reliable support structure at home and in the healthcare setting. You also need to assess dexterity as you need to have a good way to get that bladder empty. So you need to have people around who are gonna help you um, when you do bladder necks. So what's the long-term fate of uh, bladder neck procedures? Um, there have been some recent and historical studies that suggest that bladder neck procedures without augmentation are safe and effective. In select patients, we've performed bladder neck procedures without concomitant augmentation. And we sought to determine the long-term outcomes of this approach and attempt to identify risk factors for bladder deterioration. And what we found was that 45% of these patients required augmentation after isolated bladder neck procedures. And we couldn't find any urodynamic parameters that were uh, predictive. However, some exploratory analysis suggested that a detrusor pressure at 100 milliliters, that an elevated detrusor pressure, sorry, uh, after at 100 milliliters may have been predictive for a uh, delayed need for a delayed augmentation. So here's some uh, sobering data from Dr. Hoosman, and he found that after bladder neck procedures, up to 40% of patients have new renal scarring and or loss due to non-function of the kidney. 15% had CKD or three or greater, and 69% were not compliant with catheterizations, and so they put their upper tracts in jeopardy. Let's shift uh, gears a little bit to catheterizable channels. So after the introduction of CIC by Dr. Lapides, in 1972, the popularization of the Mitrofenoff principle for creating continent catheterizable channels advanced the care of patients with spina bifida. Now, there are problems that occur with catheterizable channels, and these include stomal stenosis, um, strictures, false passages, and angulation. So for stomal stenosis, dilate and place a catheter. You can apply topical steroid therapy like triamcinolone. For um, strictures and the inability to catheterize, you can try an alternate route of emptying. For example, the urethra, you can incise or dilate. And I would always leave a catheter in for two to three weeks. Always be ready to scope a patient who, com who complains of inability to catheterize. And if the channel is incontinent, think about the technique that the patient is using, but also schedule them for your dynamics. So when you look at uh, catheters, the uh, issues may be at the level of the skin or they may be subfascial. So it's important to catheterize the bladder full and empty before you get off the table. You also wanna scope the bladder full and empty if you have difficulties with catheterizations. And look for things like stenotic areas, for polyps, for angulation that can occur at the anastomosis or at the fascia. The tunnel length. Um, look for redundancy and prolapse. So if the patient gains or loses weight, you may notice that the catheter um, can prolapse or become redundant. There may be fistulas and hernias uh, that should be evaluated. Where you put things when you make your channels really matters. So folds happen, stomas can become hidden and they can kink. Um, Infections can occur if the stomas are too close. For example, if your mace and your appendicovasicostomy are too close, this may lead to, um, to difficulties. 
we actually looked retrospectively at our, core, our cohort of patients with catheterizable channels. There were 510 patients that met inclusion criteria, 214 had appendicovesicostomies, and close to 300 had Montes. About half of those were spiral Montes. And we found that stomal stenosis, overall stomal revisions and continence were similar for APVs and Montes. After 10 years from surgery, Montes were twice as likely to undergo subfascial revisions than appendicovesicostomy. And this risk was even higher for patients with spiral Montes. Hoosman had similar findings than we did um, with the smallest need for revision in the group that had tapered ilium. And I have to confess that we don't do very much tapered ilium in our patient population um, and we can't compare it to our study. Um, switching gears and something that becomes in, increasingly more difficult to talk about in uh, the adults with spina bifida is sex. So um, we've always uh, thought of bladders and kidneys and cathing and stones, but in the older population, sexuality and relationships are very important. And in a survey, Sawyer and colleagues found that 95% of late adolescents and young adults in a multidisciplinary spina bifida clinic stated they had inadequate knowledge of sexual and reproductive health. So we've looked into that quite a bit and they, because they think about it more than we think. So um, in an international uh, anonymous study, we looked to see um, where patients with spina bifida uh, learned about sex. 92 wanted the physician to talk about it with them. 55% didn't recall ever having a discussion. And when uh, we asked what age would be appropriate, boys said 14, or I should say men said 14, and girls said age 12. And it seemed that girls wanted to hear this information from their moms, but boys wanted to hear it from from physicians. Sexuality um, is negatively affected by impaired self-esteem, uh, lack of independence, lack of privacy, higher lesions, and higher uh, and hydrocephalus. So um, it's uh, been found that uh, up to 100% of men have sexual desire. Um, and about 75% of women do. When we uh, look at men, a little is known about erectile quality and erectile dysfunction in men. Um, when we asked, uh, when men were asked about sexual activity, 91% said they masturbated and 75% reported partnered intercourse. Um, and in our study, 62% uh, had partnered uh, vaginal intercourse. We uh, performed an international online survey uh, of men older than 18, and these patients were recruited from spina bifida clinics and in social media. And we collected data on the demographics and their uh, ambulatory status. We asked about penile rigidity, sexual activity, and erectile dysfunction using the erection hardness score and the international index of erectile function. And we found that only 41% reported erections firm enough for sexual intercourse with an additional 19% re reporting erections that were firm enough for masturbation and foreplay, and 22% reported erections not firm enough for any sexual activity. And ambulators, uh, as one would uh, suspect, uh, were more likely to have normal erections. If we look at therapies uh, for erectile dysfunction in men with spina bifida, um, 
about 80% uh, had some improvements using sildenafil uh, with uh, 50 percent, uh, with I'm sorry, 50 milligrams providing greater improvement when compared to 25 milligrams. Uh, recently, the anastomosis of the dorsal nerve of the penis to the intact ipsilateral ilioinguinal nerve has been described to improve penile sensation in patients with low spinal cord lesions. Um, Ternity. Uh, in men actively attempting fatherhood, paternity rates were reported to be between 56 and 73 percent, and it's more likely to occur in men with L5 or sacral lesions. Um, despite the high rates of erectile dysfunction and infertility, uh, normal testosterone production has been demonstrated in men with spina bifida. Uh, going to switch gears over to women. Um, similar to men, orgasm in women with spina bifida is dependent on their level and orgasm is rare in a woman whose lesion is above L2. Pregnancy, um, I have developed, uh, I have uh, delivered a, a fair share of, of babies over the last 15 years. Um, most women with spina bifida are fertile, and so preconceptional genetic counseling is recommended for any person with spina bifida, that's men and women. The risk of having an affected child with spina bifida is about 4% if either parent is affected. So that's why we recommend high dose folic acid, and this can be done for men as well. Increased risks of pregnancy are related to the physical deformities to VP shunts, to prior surgeries, and renal disease. And urologic complications include worsening continence, infections, hydronephrosis, and injury to the reconstruction. Dr. Stewart and colleagues found that the uh, percentage of deliveries by women with spina bifida increased about 56% between 2003 and 2013. And these women had more comorbidities and were more likely to be white, have Medicare or private insurance, live outside a city and deliver in an urban teaching hospital. And they were significantly more likely to undergo C-section. So in uh, women with spina bifida, it's about 52%. And in women without spina bifida, it's about 32%. Delivery uh, based on a review of an administrative database found that women with spina bifida uh, were more likely to have a C section. Um, they had a more uh, higher odds of morbidity compared to those uh, without spina bifida. And this wasn't seen. Uh, with vaginal delivery. I suspect it's related to the severity of the lesion and the prior surgeries. So common complications included preterm labor, urinary infection, hematologic events, and blood transfusion. So I endorse vaginal deliveries in ambulatory patients without bladder neck reconstructions because my fear is that um, women with higher level lesions are unable to push and that women with bladder neck procedures may become incontinent or have anatomic difficulties based on the surgeries that they've had before. We uh, retrospectively reviewed 18 pregnancies and 11 women. These were not easy pregnancies. 67% had uh, six uh, symptomatic UTIs, putting the fetus at risk, and after the first UTI, I routinely started patients on prophylactic antibiotics, my preference being cephalexin. Hydronephrosis was bad enough to warrant nephrostomy tubes in six pregnancies. And I routinely see these patients every month after the third month, uh, given uh, difficulties that occur with catheterization and with worsening hydronephrosis. 
So if you're invited to uh, participate in the C-section of a patient with a bladder augment, uh, I would uh, be present. I would remember that uh, the mesentery is there. I would put catheters in every uh, catheterizable channel that the patients have because uh, these are all landmines. Um, check your bladder for um, water tightness at the end of the procedure. Make sure that you haven't gone through slings or artificial uh, sphincters. Um, the complications that we found were cystotomies in about a third of the patients and three patients had delayed fistula. So really pay attention to that closure, be there while the patient, uh, while the baby's being delivered and uh, while the fascia and all are being closed. Um, get involved with these, protect your reconstruction. Um, the uh, gynecologists are all very happy to have you available to help uh, guide decision making. And these are some babies. Uh, that have been delivered. Now, I'm gonna change uh, gears just a little bit. Um, we have to remember that uh, patients get sick um, and adults with spina bifida have multiple organ system disorders at higher rates than for patients with, uh, without spina bifida or the uh, general population. Uh, when Brad DeCiano and colleagues reviewed hospitalizations for patients with spina bifida in a large administrative database, they found that UTIs, shunt malfunctions, and chronic ulcers were the most common reasons for hospitalization. And finally, we know that patients die. So this is the uh, program from one of my patients who unexpectedly died in her sleep, which is... Uh, quite sad to me to see that uh, uh, dying may make you free uh, of your disabilities. Um, when we looked at uh, when, uh, I'm sorry, DeCiano looked at patients who died, he found that most died of infectious causes with 2.5% uh, related to acute renal failure, which is uh, similar to the number related to myocardial infarction. Our study of patients who had had bladder augmentation, the leading cause of death, was non-urologic infection and pulmonary disease with only uh, two patients dying of renal failure. And there's a multi-institutional study coming out soon uh, looking at morbidity as well. So to summarize, uh, kids are easy, they're generally cute, parents do things for them, and adults are hard. Follow-up is essential, social structures change, and we have to continue to protect the kidneys. Now, whoever it is that's going to take care of these patients as they get old, please help to get them set up. And finally, remember that you worked really hard to reconstruct these patients early in life, that sex is on almost everyone's mind, that these patients get sick and die, and that, like I said before, don't abandon the patients. Please find somebody who can help these patients. A lot of our studies were supported by multiple spina bifida institutions around the world, and I'd like to thank uh, those uh, different societies and institutions as well. And um, we're done. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, otherwise, I wish you all a good night. Thanks for your attention. Good night.